The government in Ireland are well known for hiding things, for delaying things, for ignoring things. And uh, I wanted to make sure that those children were not ignored, that they weren't forgotten about. And I wanted the people who grew up in the home that they would have a voice. The vast majority of the children were just, just uh, buried without a prayer, without anyone present. They just died, they were wrapped up and they were placed at this youth's septic tank. So we had plaques made. They're made in, in bronze and they are stored away with all the names of the children who died. They are stored until we get an answer as to why this happened, how it happened, why would a religious congregation, the Bonsecour Sisters, who would have had knowledge of proper hygiene and nursing care, uh, so many should not have died. And uh, that is why I stuck with this. There was a, a, a woman in there and her four fingers were gone. And she said, what happened? She said, I cut them with a knife. So she had to be brought in and they had to be amputated altogether. And she said, why did you do that? Because of the big drums, all the gloves would be put into this, this big drum and to go around and washed. And then to be all in a heap and they had to try and pull them out. Can you imagine? Trying to tear them out. So she did that in order she wouldn't have to, she wouldn't have to work anymore. I'm PJ Haverty and I was born in the mother and baby home in Tume. I live about uh, 15 miles away from here where I was fostered out. And the reason that I'm with you here today, I just want to tell my story. What went on in Ireland in the past and of the church and the nuns, what they did that they shouldn't have done. I started my research back in 2012. Uh, I only started out small doing it doing an essay for our local historical journal, decided to do it on the home. And it's only by degrees when I found out what went on in the home. mother got pregnant and uh, somebody went down and told the priest and the priest came up to the house and of course he laid down the laws then and told her that she was to be kept indoor so as the other kids around wouldn't see her the other girls and when the baby was due to be born then that I was that she was to be taken to Chum where the nuns here would look after her. No one followed the fathers. No one closed the doors on the fathers and said hold on a minute because it takes two to make a baby. But it's the mother that had to suffer because they had to carry the baby for nine months. But nobody went chasing after the father. The priest didn't say, hold on a minute. I heard you, the father. Uh, yes, you're the father, so you have to take responsibility as well. Any woman that went in there had to suffer. She carried that child for nine months. And the next thing was she had to stay there for 12 months to look after the child, do domestic, slave and bear for what? For the Catholic, for the nuns and for all that. And the next thing was out the door and the door slammed behind your back, never to return. So when the 12 months was up, then they opened the door and told her she'd have to leave. They made all the decisions. Now, if my mother had a hundred pounds that time, which you couldn't, totally impossible, she could have bought me but they had no money back in them days. So she went around Joan looking for work then because she didn't want to leave me there. She always had in her mind, I'm going to take him out of there. So she got worked in as a cleaner in the hospital in Joan. It's closed down now since. And every week for five and a half years, she would walk to that home, knock on the door, plead with the nuns, please hand out my son. I want my son. And they said, no, go away, you're not having him. He's going to be fostered out. Eventually, anyways, I was fostered out, lucky enough now to a nice family. So the scene in the local paper then, fostering an adoption in Chum. So then they had to come down then and have a look to see what child they liked. So what my foster mother told me was that we were sitting in a circle on the floor and they would walk around and look at a child to see which one they would pick. Now my foster father would be looking for a strong, strong young lad for farming that, you know, but as they walked around, 
I just happened to look up and just gave a smile to the foster mother and that was it. I'm taking him. And that's how I was picked out. I remember the babies here in the home in Chum being all left out in the wooden pens and the bottles would be thrown in at them and you see, you see them being made by buying a rabbit that was on our birth certificates and uh, she used to throw the bottles in and other mothers would come along and feed the babies. We uh, were sent down to school then and how I remember is that's the only time we got out because I don't call that place a home, I call it a prison. That's what it was, because if you look out the windows, there's a high wall all around, you couldn't see anything. So we were marched down to school in the morning and you held on to the hand of the next child. And you were marched down with the nuns, down to school. Now, we had to go 10 minutes late in the morning. We had to leave 10 minutes early in the evening. So we wouldn't mix with the kids from outside. You know, that's the punishment. Like that. We were known as bastards. That was the name that was put on us because we were bought out of marriage. So we go in and put, put into a room and that was it. Spend the day back again, locked up again for the evening. Same thing next morning. Now the kids that would come in, if they came in late, the teacher would warn them. If you come in late now tomorrow, you will be put s sitting with the kids from the home. And they didn't want that. Because the mothers will give out to them if they go home and then say, you know, we don't want you sitting with them. Uh, even though I was only about five or six at the time, I do remember them being in the class. And I remember them as being, uh, you could say, shabby, kind of uh, cold looking, uh, very thin and very, very quiet. And uh, they weren't treated the same as the rest of the children in the class. They were kind of kept on their own. They were segregated and they were, they were uh, very seldom they would be asked questions. They just sat there during the day. And uh, we were told by the nuns uh, not to mix with those children. Oh, they used to throw, uh, here in the hall, they used to throw the bread out. Like, you, you know the batch loaves? And squeeze them and throw them out at you, as if they were, we were animals. And we, the people had just grabbed them up and now used to eat the master. It was lovely. And I say that's why I was in the hospital a lot for. I was put down as a celiac. But I'm not suffering with that today. The kids outside, they could enjoy Christmas coming, Easter coming, summer coming, because holidays. Like, we hadn't a clue about that. When I went out to my foster mother's home, nearly seven years of age, and they're putting up the Christmas tree and they were explaining it to me, and they're all excited. You know, the glass of milk and the carrot for the roll top, and, and then you were put to bed early. And like, this was all new to me at seven years of age, like. Luckily enough, in the 1980s, um, a woman taped her of her experience in the home and there's a wealth of information there of how the mothers were treated, how the children were treated, how they were ignored, how they were left to their own devices, how they were never uh, stimulated or encouraged. There was no books, no toys. They were just left wandering in, uh, around like little puppies. An elderly man used to laugh at us because if there was a car or something parked on the side of the road, we used to look into the mirror and we start laughing and looking again. We didn't realize it was a mirror. We thought it was just one of these funny glass. But they were very cruel, the nuns. I remember a child there. Now, I didn't save my other documentary, and you mightn't put it in it to it either. A child being kicked. And I don't know where, uh, the nun, it was a nun, and she was a small nun. Now, I know the child was smaller than me when I look back at it. And they kicked her, and the blood was pouring out of her. She was taken away. I'd never seen the child after that, never. Now, I was older, I was about nine, you know. Tune was probably the first supermarket in Ireland where people could come in and buy babies. And if the weak one then, well, if I died, that's it, just get rid of it. It's like bad fruit. When I found that, then I started really getting into the whole story, wanting to do more, wanting those children to be heard, wanting the story to be out there. 
and then of course the uh, the burials then were the were the epitome of the whole thing. So many died, uh, a lot of them needlessly, and they were just wiped away. They were just wiped out of history. They were put down in a former sewage tank. They weren't even given the decency of a burial or of a few prayers or even of a little coffin. I'd milk the cows in the morning before I went to school. I'd milk them again in the evening. And I'd go to school in the morning, hail, rain or snow. And this woman, neighbour, my friend would tell you, she used to collect me after the road being called and I'd have to house, polish the house. They had seven bedrooms. You know, no, nobody uh, ever came around along and asked you how you were. It, they always went to the foster mother and the foster father. They never spoke to the child. They seen you and you were dressed, you were well dressed and you were fed and that kind of thing. But they never cons uh, considered your emotional needs. And that was never looked at. And I don't think that was looked at in, in lots of children that were fostered. They were, uh, um, they were a commodity in lots of houses. Same as I was a commodity. Because the only reason they fostered me was to help them work on the land. It's hard to describe, it's very hard to describe. You know, you, you can sit, say so much like, but there's something else that won't come out that you want to tell, kind of, I don't know what it is. And I often think people committing suicide and everything and people say they're sick, they're this, they're that, and uh, I don't know, it's just hard to explain what. It's, I suppose, just life. I say it's kind of, your mind is dead and that's it. That's the way I feel, even the body is still moving. That's the way you could nearly put it, kind of thing. And you just want to jump in and get finished with a lot of it then. And I suppose you had somebody to talk to, or thing like that, you know, maybe if you had a friend or somebody, it's hard to know. People do have friends and they still do it. So it's just one of those things, just one of those things. But I'm lucky that I did snap out, more goes ahead with it and do it. And, and you can show that you're happy and everything, like, you know, and deep down inside you're not happy. You're not happy even, say you want to let your foster parents know that you were happy and all that. And, but at the back of your mind, you had the sickness or depression or fed up or life meant nothing to you. Or it's just uh, so I probably won the lucky once. Because as I said, out the road there now, there's a house out there and a man drowned there in the river as well. But he was drunk when he came in from the pub and he used to be on a bicycle. And. Uh, yeah, but this will be going through your head when you think, oh yeah, he drowned himself and didn't see your foster father's sister drowned in the tank as well. So when you see them things, you think, oh well, that's one way to go. It's hard to explain how much a person who doesn't know who they are, they need how they desperately need their identity of where they came from and who they belong to and what they're made up of. It's just it's 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 a human right. Oh, they they battled me one time with my teeth. They, I I um, what happened there? Oh, I hadn't the work done, and uh, the son came along, and he battled my face against the wall and pulled me head and uh, battled me against the wall, and all uh, my teeth were destroyed. So, a twelve-year-old, I had four dentures. 12-year-old I had dentures. The girls who grew up in the home and they were fostered out, they had no sex education and they didn't really understand how, the, how pregnancy occurred and they never had any affection from anybody, even in the home or then when they went out to this family they were treated as a slave 
and um, I suppose they met these men or young boys and all of a sudden they have somebody to care for them and who like them and uh, a lot of the time they will get taken advantage of because as I said they don't know what how, how the, they don't know what their, their body their own bodies and they end up pregnant and they don't know how or why and of course they end up in the same system back in the home again and their own child will be taken off them so it's a vicious circle all along a lot of them got work on farms and that and uh, of course they were an easy target for people and they would have been raped quite a lot of them he was only a few years older than me he was going to college yeah and he, the first time he did it was in his mother's own mother and father's bed and he, do you know what I mean? Like, it wasn't my bed at all. It was his mother and father's bed. And then after that, then it was the haystacks and the lofts and that. So, and I, I didn't know what he was doing, to be honest, which I didn't know. Didn't know. When the babies died there, the nuns were getting five pounds from the council to bury the child. And instead of that, then they kept the five pound and they put the, the child in the dis disused uh, sewage tank because it was empty anyways. If you're baptised, you're supposed to get a diesel burial. And the most annoying thing about it, when the hospital and the home closed down, they took the nuns' remains, they brought in new coffins and took the remains up of the nuns and brought them down and buried them in Knock. So, in that, in, in that disgraceful, and to do what they did, what we call them angels in, the, in that septic tank, they could do that to the nuns. They were buried twice, so they were, with full church, Catholic, the lot. We probably wouldn't be here today, only for Catholic Corbus and Miss like, Miss PJ and I, like, we met together like that. We wouldn't know one another, you know. Why, why, why is such a grievance in the Catholic Church? There's no apology from the bishop, no apology from the nuns. The government in Ireland are well known for hiding things, for delaying things for ignoring things and uh, I wanted to make sure that those children were not ignored, that they weren't forgotten about and I wanted the people who grew up in the home that they would have a voice. I went to my social worker in Galway and I made a special uh, journey to her and uh, I had an appointment, it was two o'clock in the day and I know it was bank holiday weekend because that's how I met my husband and I went specially down to her. I was in five minutes with her and I said, I want to make a complaint. I was only 26 at the time. The, 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 the abuse I got when I was a child with them people. And she said, you're no longer in my jurisdiction, she said. And she said, I don't need to hear this. She said, you're no longer in my jurisdiction. She was a social worker at the time. And that's what I was. I came out and I cried and I cried and I cried. I said, such a waste of journey. I'd love to get into them, the mind of these nuns and what way they were thinking of because as I said they were followers of Christ and they're supposed to look after the poor, the vulnerable, the weak and the dying and that. And why did they do what they did like you know and then when you look then you think greed, power and money as the world destroyed and that's what happened to these nuns, that's what happened Rome, the church, everything, it all came down to power and money, control on everyone. Let's go, let's go.